Hey guys, it's Sandro here, and welcome to part 2 of the detail on this magnificent Mercedes E63S AMG. In part 1, we went through all the preparation steps to get to this paint correction stage, which I'm going to jump straight into by doing a first test section to discover which compound, pad and technique is going to produce the best results in the least aggressive manner. So for this, I'm using my cordless Shymate 21mm 6 inch polisher with the Lake Country Orange STO foam pad and Shine Supply Classic Polish as a starting point. It's a large, fresh, unused pad, so I'm going to start with 5 drops of product on it, set my machine speed to about 4.5, spread the product into a section about 6 to 8 times the size of my pad, and using just light pressure and a moderate arm speed. I'm going to do three passes in total as a starting technique, which should take about 80 seconds to complete. I'm going to let this footage run from start to finish in real time for this first test section so you guys can see it for yourselves. But I'll be editing the following test sections and footage so this video can keep moving at least at a somewhat timely manner. Now this pad and compound selection as well as this technique is a very light and non-aggressive combination which is obviously a great place to start just to get an idea of what this paint is going to be like to work with and ultimately what it's going to take to reach my objective of removing at least 95% of the existing defects and obtaining the best gloss and clarity levels possible by the end. But just as important is doing it in the least aggressive manner as to preserve as much of the original clear coat as possible. And it would also be ideal to be able to achieve these objectives in a single stage process, which would obviously be more time and cost effective, as well as limit the amount of paint correction and aggression needed. So I just wanted to start this video by explaining those four driving objectives, which once again are defect removal, gloss enhancement, paint preservation and efficiency as it's important to firstly understand your objectives, which can certainly be different to mine, before proceeding, as they will determine how you proceed as well as keep you on track as you progress throughout this whole paint correction process. I'll be blowing up my pads after every single set of passes to control the residue buildup. I'll be using masking tape during my testing to help me more clearly judge my results, as well as performing an IPA wipe to remove polishing oils which could falsify the results and most importantly using a good defect spotting light to correctly inspect and judge my results. Now this paint has an extremely high and diversified metallic flake content which looks fantastic but it makes it really hard to capture the results clearly on camera. So I'll do my best to talk you through what I was seeing in person. As far as defect removal, I'd say that this combination eliminated at least 50% of the existing defects, which were basically lighter swirls, water spots, and maybe even a little oxidation and haze. And it additionally boosted the gloss and clarity levels, so it's fair to say that it worked reasonably well and was certainly able to improve the paint's finish. However, to achieve that high end result that I'm chasing, I need a combination that can cut a little more on this specific paint and perhaps also do a little more at achieving a better gloss and clarity outcome. Now since Classic Polish did a fairly good job at both defect removal and improved clarity, I decided to stick with it, but this time use it with a slightly more aggressive pad in the form of the Lake Country Blue SDO Foam Light Cutting Pad to help improve the compound's cut and potentially finishing abilities on this specific paint. Additionally, I turned up my machine speed just half a notch, applied just a touch more pressure and also slowed my arm speed ever so slightly. These little adjustments in my technique are all about giving this second test section the potential to cut a little better, as based on the results of my first test section, a little more cut is what I really need here to obtain a better outcome.
Now looking at the results, this was definitely an all-round improvement compared to the prior test. The defect removal was better, I'd say a good 70 to 75%, and the gloss and clarity levels were also better, just allowing those metallic flakes to pop a little more and showing a sharper reflection of my lights. But again, with about 25% of the more moderate swirls and water etchings still remaining, as well as perhaps the potential for even better gloss levels, this wasn't going to work in achieving my objectives for that high-end finish. What I can also say at this stage is that the paint certainly wasn't soft or sensitive, as generally a light coating foam pad won't finish so well on softer paints. But beyond that, I'll have to do a little more testing to discover just how hard it really is. For a third test section, I once again stuck with classic polish, as so far it's been working quite well. But this time went yet again another step up in aggression and used the Rubez Medium Yellow Wool Cutting Pad. So again, this was all about trying to get a little more cut and defect removal out of classic polish, but still try to retain its great finishing ability so far. Now unlike foam pad cells that tend to self-prime quite easily, the refined wool strands on these quite unique Rippers wool pads do need some initial priming to get them all nicely coated and performing optimally. But apart from that, you'll find that my general technique was quite similar to the previous sections. Now as we have a look at the results, I'll start by saying that the defect removal here was fantastic. And apart from where the masking tape line was, the defect removal was definitely 95% plus reaching that objective. However, as you also hopefully see quite clearly, this pad and combination created quite a lot of haze in the finish, giving it that dull, milky look, which as a single stage combination just isn't going to work at all. Now I can tell you that I've used this same pad on both softer and harder paints in the past with quite an exceptional finish. But this is the reason why we always test and evaluate results, as quite obviously it hasn't finished well here. And that could be due to this specific paint just not liking it, or its combination with this particular polish or the climate and machine or technique used. There's just so many variables in paint correction much of which we still don't fully understand, and anyone who claims to have all the answers is simply lying or delusional. But I guess that's what makes it so interesting and challenging at times and always a learning experience. For a fourth test section, I wasn't done with classic polish just yet and decided to try it with the ShineMate microfiber pad. This is actually one of the best finishing microfiber pads I've ever used. And generally, if I can't finish perfectly with this pad, then no microfiber pad will. This pad does however suffer from excess heat buildup, so to manage that, I slowed my machine speed down and eased off the pressure and just moved my arm a little faster during that set. But when working with microfiber pads in general, you want to always adjust your technique to minimize heat, as it's one of the biggest downsides of microfiber pads. Now looking at the results, I can definitely see that the finish here was better than at least the last section, having a lot less haze and micro marring. But it still had some obvious haze that just wouldn't work as a single stage correction. 
Additionally, the cut was good and much better than the foam pads, but not as good as the last section with the Rupes wool pad. So in essence, it's a slightly better finish, but slightly less defect removal, but overall not a winning one-step combination yet again. What this also tells me about this specific Mercedes paint is that although it's not a soft paint, it's also not a rock hard paint and has a little sensitivity to it. So I'd say it's really a medium hardness paint based on my testing so far. Now in truth, I could probably try dozens more combinations with classic polish on different pads with different machines and techniques. But at some point you have to move on and I felt I'd reached that point. So my next step was trying a slightly more aggressive compound in the form of Shine Supply Classic Cut and going right back to my first polishing foam pad. Now sometimes medium to heavier compounds have a harder time breaking down especially on softer foam finishing or polishing pads. So I did a fourth pass in this section to make sure that that wasn't going to be an issue. Now every test you do always provides you with valuable information about that paint. And at this point I know that this paint is finishing beautifully with both foam pads that I've tried. But I just wasn't getting enough cut when using them with a finer polish. So my thinking here is that if I can retain the great finish of those pads but increase their cut with a more capable compound then that could be a winner. Looking at the results in this fifth test section I would say that so far if I had to choose one of these combinations to move forward with in a single stage correction it would have to be this one. The defect removal was what I'd say about 80 to 85 percent and the finish was almost perfect apart from just the tiniest bit of haze that I'm sure I'd be able to eliminate by just tweaking my technique to maybe add a little less compound or switch to a smaller 15 mm throw DA polisher. But here's the thing, when you decrease aggression to improve the finishing quality of a combination, you also, at least to some extent, decrease the cut or defect removal. And since I still need a little more cut to reach my defect removal goal of 95% plus, this combination just wasn't going to work. So for a sixth combination test, I stuck with Classic Cut, but this time used it with the Lake Country Blue SDO foam pad, which has a little more cut but can still finish extremely well. Now once we have a look at the results, you'll hopefully see that the defect removal was fantastic, achieving that 95% plus defect free finish. However, this pad with this compound on this paint with this technique unfortunately produced a little too much haze and micro marring that isn't something I'd be able to eliminate with just some minor tweaks. Meaning that unfortunately it just wasn't going to work yet again. Now sevens a lucky number, right? So for a seventh test section, I stuck with the same blue foam pad, but this time switched to Shell Concepts S20 Black Medium Compound. If I had to compare S20 Black to Classic Cut, I'd say that S20 finishes a little better, but Classic Cut tends to cut a little more, though they are quite close in many other characteristics. But since my main issue here was finishing well, I thought that this could be a good combination to try. My overall technique was identical, using the same machine speed, pressure and arm movements, and I was really hoping this would be the one. Otherwise, I'd have to start looking for a two-stage combination, which I really didn't want to do based on my objectives.
Now, as far as defect removal goes, I'd say that this was bang on 95%, and just as I guessed, a touch less cut than classic cut. And also, as I'd guessed and hoped, it did in fact finish better and almost perfectly with just the slightest amount of haze that I'm sure I could address. So at this stage, I felt a little more confident that I was going to be able to achieve what I set out to accomplish in a single stage correction. Now in my experience, one of the easiest ways to improve a combination's finishing ability without compromising its cut too much is to switch to a smaller throw dual action polisher or sometimes when working with a rotary or gear driven DA just switch to a smaller backing plate and pad. So for an 8th and hopefully final combination test, I switched to a 15mm throw dual action polisher and smaller 5 inch pad to test that out on this paint. Now switching to a smaller throw and pad size does mean you should slightly decrease your work size area which ultimately means it will take a little longer to do the whole car. But if it means you don't have to do two stages of polishing and can get away with one, it's obviously still going to be a much quicker, safer and more efficient process without compromising the quality of your work. Needless to say guys, this was finally the winning combination. The defect removal was still 95% plus, the gloss and clarity levels were fantastic, with a great reflective and vibrant finish, and it was all achieved using the very least aggressive method in a single stage, which ticked all the boxes on my list. So just a quick rundown of my paint correction setup for this job. I've got my larger polisher for all the flat work on the larger panel areas and my smaller mini polisher for most of the panel edge work. I tend to work with three pads at a time for each polisher, making sure I rotate the pads after every few polishing sets to allow them to cool down. Apart from my studio lights, I'll also be using my defect spotting handheld light to check my work as I go. I've got my IPA panel wipe to remove the polishing oils a bunch of clean microfiber cloths, some ear protection and anti-vibration gloves, and I'll also most likely be using my smaller 1 and 2 inch macro polishers in certain areas as needed, and my masking tape as I will most likely be doing some additional masking. I've got a couple of extra trolleys on either side of the car to place my equipment and products as I make my way around the vehicle, and my creeper stools for sitting down while correcting the lower panels. Now just before I take a break from all the talking and explaining, as I finish up correcting the bonnet, I'll just quickly explain edge work and flat work. The way I generally approach each panel is by firstly doing my edge work, which basically means polishing the paint around panel edges and certain body lines, where a larger polisher simply isn't as effective but more importantly, where a larger polisher can be overly aggressive. So around these more intricate and delicate areas, you will find that a mini or macro polisher is not only more effective at correcting the paint, but also less aggressive. And usually, when we're talking about high-end paint correction, edge work is also the most time-consuming part, so it's also something I prefer to get out of the way first. Flat work is basically all the larger, more standard panel sections where a larger polisher and pad is simply going to be far quicker and more efficient to work with. And it's honestly a lot easier, less stressful and quicker to complete compared to the edge work. It's also important to note that you should always overlap your edge work with your flat work to ensure you get a completely uniform finish across the entire panel. Don't 
So with the bonnet all completed, I hope you guys can see just what a dramatic difference was achieved as all those metallic flakes just came alive with new vibrancy and brilliance. And the overall black paint just became darker, richer, almost looking like a black glass panel that I just couldn't have been more happy with. Now, as I mentioned in part one, this car has an entire glass roof. In fact, the whole car's exterior surface area is about one third glass. And as we also saw in part one, there's quite a few water spots and etchings that just didn't budge during the decontamination process, so they will need to be corrected out. Now, the whole process of working on glass to remove water spots and restore clarity is much the same way of working on paint. In fact, I used the exact same combination as I did on the paint. Glass is super hard and not sensitive at all when it comes to polishing it. So you really don't need to worry about being too aggressive or creating things like haze unless you really go nuts with something extremely aggressive. But as with paint in general, the same rules still stand, which is to use the least aggressive method that works. 
and in this particular case you will hopefully see that my combination on the paint worked perfectly on the glass not only to remove the water etchings but also restore fantastic clarity and transparency to the glass which had really been caked up with a strong bonded traffic film layer that was really dulling and hazing the look of all the glass panels. I'll also add here that the owner actually didn't opt to have the glass corrected and coated. But once I saw the state of the glass close up, it was just something I had to do or else it just would have let the whole finish of the paint and the car down.
Now the B-pillar black piano plastics were the only panels on this car where I couldn't get a perfect finish with just a single stage correction. So in the end, I did have to do a follow-up second stage using Shell Concepts S30 Plus on the Lake Country Orange SDO foam pad, which worked perfectly to clean up any haze and get them looking as good as new. As I continue correcting the paint, I just want to touch on a couple of hopefully useful points. As a detailer, you never stop learning unless you give up on trying to be better at what you do. So for me, I never stop learning. I try to push and challenge myself and every car I do is always an educational experience. Now with these videos, I try and take you guys through that learning journey, but trust me, I know it would be easier to do things like just grab a heavier cutting compound and pad that I know is going to remove all the defects and then just switch to a finer pad and compound to refine the finish, which really wouldn't take much testing at all and should work well maybe 8 or 9 times out of 10. But that's not how to respectfully correct car paint and preserve as much clear coat as possible. Using a combination that is more aggressive than it needs to be just because it's bound to remove all the defects is an easy option, but it's certainly not the best option for the longevity of that paint. And performing a two-stage correction when the possibility of a one-stage correction is a viable option is also the easy way out, as it takes a lot more testing and skill to get both fantastic cut and a fantastic finish in a one-step process compared to using a two-step process, which is far easier to get right, but generally more time-consuming and aggressive on the paint by the end. So I just want you guys to understand where I'm coming from, and I'd like you to come away from these videos being more knowledgeable and understanding about what respectful and skillful high-end detailing work is all about and why it's such a time-consuming specialty craft when it's done right. The other extremely important point I want to cover here is consistency. It's all good and well taking the time to fine tune your combination, but if you don't work methodically and uniformly from your first test section to your last, your results are going to suffer. What this basically means is sticking to your winning test section combination and technique and trying to resist straying from it. So don't start doubling the size of your work sections. Don't start doubling or halving the amount of compound on your pad or start using more or less pressure or quicker or shorter working times. And make sure you constantly blow out your pads and rotate them and check your results with some good lighting. This is actually a really difficult thing to do over the course of an entire day because we're all human guys and we all get worn down. But as a consequence, your results will start to suffer. The best thing you can do is take regular breaks. Even just walking away and sitting down for 5 minutes every couple of hours can have a huge impact in resetting and refreshing your mind and resting your body. I actually like to set goals and rewards, which can be something like, in the next 2 hours I'm going to finish these 2 panels and then I'll treat myself to a coffee as a reward. At least for me, it really helps focus myself throughout the day. And of course, stay hydrated, wear comfortable shoes and try to use your legs and bend your knees to position yourself rather than bending your back.
Now, as I wrap up part two of this series, I'll just say a couple more things before I leave you guys with the rest of the footage. There's lots and lots of different ways of approaching pain correction or car detailing in general. So I don't want you guys to think for a moment that I'm the sort of person that thinks it's my way or the highway. I've been so lucky to meet so many talented and skilled detailers in my time that work so differently to me. And I greatly respect the work they do and the people they are. But no two detailers are alike. And when you guys detail your own cars, you'll also find your own way of doing it too. I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's not necessarily about doing it right or wrong or better or worse. It's more so about understanding those objectives that I've been talking about throughout this whole video. And the thing is, my objectives aren't going to be the same as everyone else, nor is my budget, my specific skill set and the ultimate outcome. What a boring world it would be if we all did everything identically and lost that beautiful human element that makes us all unique and allows us all to offer something uniquely special only to us. Now as I sign off, I'd like to ask you guys for a favor. If you enjoy this content and would like to say thanks and help support future content, you can do so by buying me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash ccad, all caps, which I'll have a link to in the description box and would be greatly appreciated. Please stay tuned for part three and the final chapter of this series where I'll be coding the vehicle and showing you guys the final finished results. I really hope you guys enjoyed and found this video useful. Please share this video, like, comment and subscribe to this channel to show you support for this content and I'll see you guys soon.